introduce to you Mr. William Green. who is a member of the uh, Educators to Africa and at one time in charge of African American Studies for the Philadelphia Board of Education. And most of us who are from Philadelphia realize that Mr. Green is one of the founders, he and Mrs. Green, of the Ivy League School. At this time, I will present Mr. Green, who in turn will introduce our speaker of the afternoon. Good afternoon. I consider it a rare privilege to be given the opportunity to introduce one of the deans of African and Afro-American Studies. Dr. John Henrik Clark was born in the South, in the town of Union Springs, Alabama. He grew up in Columbus, Ohio, or Columbus, Georgia. In 1933, he ventured to New York City with the ambition to become a writer. Those were very, very difficult days in New York at that time, during the Depression, but his perseverance and his commitment to writing was so great that he continued to keep this as a goal. During World War II, he served in the United States military forces as an Air Force Sergeant Major. Throughout his active career as a history scholar, as an editor, a teacher, a poet, lecturer, critic, and short story writer, he has been an outspoken devotee of African liberation on the continent and in the diaspora. His numerous articles and uh, papers, position papers, have been published in leading journals throughout the world. He has written or edited 21 books and has published over 50 short stories. His best known being The Boy Who Painted Christ Black. I found it to be one of the most absorbing and well, one of the most absorbing and, and uh, sophisticated pieces of literature that I have ever read. Dr. Clark is a man who is a world traveler. He has traveled all over the world, having visited Europe, Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, and numerous states in this land. He was the first president of the African Heritage Studies Association and has been a staff member of a number of various publications. He also was the co-founder and editor of the Harlem Quarterly and the associate editor of Freedom Way magazine. In 1983, Dr. Clark was appointed a Thomas Hunter professor at uh, Hunter College where he has served with great distinction. Because of the high esteem in which he is held by the members of ETA, an endowment fund in his honor was established <coughs> by this organization at Temple University to be administered by the African American Studies Department. Although a slight disadvantage and time has slowed him down somewhat, this great warrior's enthusiasm and commitment remains the same. Join me in welcoming a great poet, an independent thinker, a voice of conscience, an institution, an African prince, Dr. John Henry Clark. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here addressing this organization Again, it has played a major role in my own development, in my association with the organization, can be used as a marker in the progression of my own continued interest in Africa, in my relationship to other people 
who manifest that same interest. The first lecture I gave after I had a major stroke in 1982 was to this organization. I had previously lectured to the organization. And I was the last time here, the commencement speaker for the organization. And I took pride in the caliber of students that you continuously turn out. I believe not only in the educators to Africa, the African connection, I believe in the independent school. I believe in an African world community. And I believe we are capable of building an African world community. We have already shown the capacity to mingle with people, to amalgam our culture with theirs, and theirs with ours, without destroying any of them. And in the serious study of African people in the pre-Columbian period in the New World, so-called, in the special issue of the Journal of African Civilization, edited by Professor Van Sediment, the Africans in early America, it is shown that the Africans mingled with the indigenous Americans, fertilized their culture, and they enhanced African culture, that that mutual exchange made for the creation of still a separate and a distinct culture consisting of the best elements of the two. We have already proven in the evidence of Africans in Asia, evidence of Africans throughout South America, we have already proven that the world need not be in fear when African people are in power. The European has never proven that, and he never will, because his age of grandeur, his age of wealth, was that time when he had millions of people outside of Europe to exploit, when he had invaded other people's country, violated other people's women, taken other people's resources. We have no such picture in our whole history. Very often our children are asking us now, when you explain about slavery and explain about the greatness of Africans in Egypt and in the Niger River, as well as the Nile, if we were so great, why did we lose it? Anytime any people fail to adjust, to the nature of change, they lose, no matter who they are. And this is not a racial matter. You can say, eventually, the great civilizations of Africa fell, but they fell after living 10 times longer than the longest civilization outside of Africa ever lived. Civilizations like people grow tired. And if their energy is not renewed, if their perspective on life is not renewed, if they fail to meet a challenge, then the change of history will change their place in history. Now my mental notes for this talk with the values in old Africa, how we can look back at them and use some of them today. I know full well 
that you cannot fully reconstitute any civilization, Roman, Greek, or otherwise, although I'm reluctant to call what the Romans had a civilization or what the Greeks had a civilization. It was a synthetic amalgam taken from other people. And remember, at the height of Rome and Greece, when they were talking about democracy in the Senate, democracy in Rome, 85% of the population were slaves. They were slaves to the other Romans who had the leisure to talk about democracy because slaves were doing their work. <laughs> understand one thing very clear, and if you understand it, you can set your clock by it. It's so dependable. The European has never believed in democracy and never will. He has never believed in Christianity and never will. The Christianity he believed in was something he pulled together at the conference at Nicaea, 325 AD. He took an African and an Eastern religion and he Europeanized it, whitened it up, and made it the handmaid for European world domination. He used it to justify his domination over other people. And he said that people were outside of that religion were free game for slavery. Then, if his God is kind, and if his God is merciful, and if all living things are under his God, no one is free game for slavery, not even those who you think have no soul. I maintain that he did a disservice to the, con to the concept of religion because he took it from old belief systems, he formulized it and dogmatized it and ruined it. Karl Marx did the same thing with communism that he didn't quite understand. That's right. That's right. This is going to confuse a lot of you because you think so much started with Europe. <laughs> but they're using the carbon copies of somebody else's original, a fading carbon copy at that. <laughs> communism didn't fail. The communists failed. Christianity didn't fail. The Christians failed because they failed to understand it and they failed to understand that these high ideals, these humane ideals, are at odds with their temperament, at odds with their power desires. They, they, they have come into conflict with commandments. If they obey two of the Tenth Commandments, they would have to dismantle their whole society. <laughs> Thou shall not steal. All right. He stole you. <laughs> Having stole you, he built an economic system on the labor he took from you without pay. Yeah. Right. Thou shall not murder. He murdered you into the million to the point where when we talk of Holocaust, mm. while we're sympathetic toward the people in that six million, but we start our count at 60 million. And we're just beginning to count. Mm -hmm. Want to talk about Holocaust? Let's talk about Holocaust the way we talk about fish stories. Mm -hmm. The man caught the biggest fish, do the most talking. <laughs> Why then were they at war against these old societies and the values of old, these old societies? Because they could not understand these societies. And they could not understand societies 
that were not at war with themselves. <clears throat> so they put them at war with themselves. They put one against the other, pretending to favor one and end up conquering both of them. Now, if you didn't learn anything else from Godfather 1 or 2, <laughs> you learn one thing that you need to keep in mind. One thing that you need to practice today. Never, absolutely never, let an outsider arbitrate your family disputes. So up old drunken Uncle Willie, anybody. <laughs> So long as it's a member of the family. Because anytime you invite a member of the family to arbitrate your family, member outside of the family, to arbitrate your family disputes, you have confessed a weakness that tells the arbitrator he can enslave you. That's the mistake the Africans made then. And that's the mistake the Africans are still making. If you can't settle your internal disputes, you're a fair game for conquerors. Now, what he had to do, the European, in the 15th and the 16th century, he had to make the African forget the kind of societies he built without the Europeans' help and without the Europeans' presence. He had to remove from your historical memory the fact that over half of human history was over before anyone knew that a European was in the world. Societies were built, nations rose and formed. Different belief systems came and went and they didn't have to have walls. Anytime you want to change a belief system in the Western world, you've got to have a holy wall. The same is true of the Arabs in Islam. And we won't get into that. I, I would need more, more than a bulletproof vest. <laughs> and it's my age, I don't run so fast. <laughs> and I'm almost totally blind. So I would need good bodyguards, and I want somebody to watch the bodyguards. <laughs> because the bodyguards might be my assassin. Anytime you discuss, take the wraps off religion, and discuss how religion systematically kills something higher than religion, which is spirituality, you'd be prepared to run. Because people get hung up with dogma, hung up with ism, hung up with somebody else's story, and forget to tell their own story. I heard someone yesterday say, and girl, wait on the table. What's wrong with people, they don't know nothing. If you want to know anything, read the Bible. <laughs> that will tell you all you want to know, all you need to know. Two years ago, a Catholic institution, Fordham University, said the Bible was allegory folk tales, myth and supposition told to illustrate truth, but not necessarily the truth. Now if the Catholic Church says it, all right, they're the aristocrats of the religions. <laughs> what, 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 what that dispute? Other people said it all along. This is not to downgrade or take away anybody's religion. I hope no one ever leaves any church, least of all on my behalf. 
I grew up a Baptist. I was a Baptist Sunday school teacher, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the Baptist church, though it is the loudest and the wrongest and the most corrupt of them all. <laughs> but it is not dumb. <laughs> It is the only religion patterned after our original African religions. Even the songs are patterned after our original African songs. The circle is patterned after our original African ceremonies. The preacher is patterned after the, after the chief. Oh, he's corrupt and bloated and <laughs> overfed. <laughs> it is still patterned after the concept of the chief. And we quite forget that in African society, the chief owns no wealth, but he is the guardian of the wealth. And he has all the, he has sustaining wealth while he's the chief. And that wealth is to sustain him while he is the guardian of other people's wealth. The Baptist preacher got the thing wrong. <laughs> African chiefs don't have any Cadillacs. African chiefs don't have any committee to make sure that they get so many suits a year. Another committee in the church makes sure the preacher gets extra money for his vacation. This is a form of hustlerism of a whole lot of spiritually starved people. Now what can we take from our old customs to use now in as much as we have been doing it without understanding what we are doing? Now I've traveled all over Africa except South Africa. And many traits I saw in New Orleans, I saw in Africa. But we, but in New Orleans, they only remembered a part of it. And I, I saw the rest of it. In Ghana, when there's death in a family, and this time it was a male died and his wife, all of the women of her age groups get around her and mourn mourn with her. There is no loneliness. See, you came out of a we society. You was drafted against your will into a me society, an individual society. And you are arrogant enough to say sometimes, mind your own business. You ain't got nothing to do with it. You came out of society where everybody's business was everybody's business. But you had no prostitution. You had no hunger. And if a girl gets to a certain age and hasn't got a husband, the community finds her one. Now that sounds very unromantic to you and your Western mind, but do you have one? <laughs> the community took upon themselves to find a family with a person your age group, negotiate with the family, and the two families got together and put together the means of you starting life. And so when they're negotiating, they're not negotiating about romance, because the romantic wedding is a Western invention. The love of you marriage. <laughs> They're negotiating for the I respect you marriage. And so when they're negotiating, they're negotiating about how many goats, how many goats will come from this side, how many sheep, how many cattle. And so they got 30 
30 cows before they even start, before they marry. They got 30 cows from both families. They, they got a, a herd of 60. And they had not even married. Come from, and and they, they got a support system. Therefore, they ain't got no system. They don't have to go to any, any uh, social agency. No relief agency. No hair shrink of oh, how uncivilized they are. Never heard of a psychiatrist. Poor people. <laughs> how could they manage? <laughs> And for years, never heard of a jail because no one had ever gone to one. My main point here is that African societies were ruled by something which you can reconstitute. Honor and obligation. That's the basis of this whole society. Honor and obligation. Now, take the phrase, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. What else is the meaning of that phrase? Honor and obligation. Now, you can throw out the rest if you want to. If you have to discard the rest, that's enough to guide you. And if you just remember, Africans were obligated to each other as a matter of honor. I will not, if I came from tribe A, I will not disgrace myself because it will reflect badly on A. I think too much of myself to bring dishonor on my group. So what we are dealing with now is not civil law. We are dealing with something in African societies stronger than civil law. We're dealing with custom. Custom was so binding that custom was tantamount to law. More binding than law. The African societies never said in their commandments, thou shall not. And when you read the original African omissions of purity that foreigners call the Tenth Commandments, the foreigners changed the language around. These were omissions after you studied morality, studied the great school of Luxor. You stand before your teacher and say, I have not violated my neighbor's wife. I have not stolen my neighbor's property. Now foreigners come along, and how's he change the language? Thou shall not. Look at the dictatorial arrogance. Thou shall not. When the Africans gave the teacher, the assurance, I have not. And once these confessions are made, if they're convincing to the, to the teacher, then the teacher passes you to the next higher step of learning. Now some fool comes along and think he gave you Christianity. And you had a much better concept all along. I'm saying your problem today is that you think everything in your life must come from outside and you've forgotten the better things you created and you didn't give it a name. When you created a concept that Europeans would later call communism, you created great sharing societies no great millionaires. Now you have a concept in the world that if nations are going to exist, you got to have capitalism, 
You got to have some people with a whole pile of money touching the sky. And for them to maintain that pile of money, somebody got to be unemployed. They built the pyramids without it. They built the pyramids without an industrial system. So don't ask, don't let your students say that mathematics is hard. It must have been much harder for those who built the pyramid and they looked like you. You have to go back and look at your own values. Now, I'm not going to insult your intelligence by arguing about whether Egypt was Africa. No more than I would insult your intelligence by arguing about whether your right hand belongs on the same body as your left hand. The Nile Valley, the Nile River, stretches 4,000 miles into the body of Africa. It was the world's first cultural highway. That great amalgam of people coming from the south who had laid the, the basis for the civilization of Egypt long before the Greeks called it Egypt brought together the greatest combination of technicians, mentality, thinkers, priests, spiritual leaders the world has ever known. No comparable group of people have ever been assembled in the history of the whole world. And when the area once called the Green Sahara dried up. The technicians of all of this part of Africa began to gravitate toward the Nile. The Nile civilization could feed large numbers of people. It had created massive agriculture. It had created something that if people had enough of them today, and enough fresh water, they could survive the dried bean. One thing about the dried bean, if you stow it properly, you can keep it indefinitely. And if you soak it overnight, you can cook it the next day. Add to it whatsoever you want to add to it. And if you're a Muslim, you'll add to the substance goes with that. Then if you're a down homer, throw a hunt hawk in there. <laughs> no sin either way the way I see it. Although I've been off pole for over 10 years, nothing to do with religion at all. This has something to do with health. <laughs> I want to stay here on this earth and I have to be careful with this lean hair, what's left of it, in order to stay here. So I decided, after years of Malcolm X kidding me as a swine eater, <laughs> to take my vacation from the swine. <laughs> Although I grew up on the swine. And once we understand that we were not only not pork eaters of great consequence before slavery, large number of us were not meat eaters of any consequence before slavery. And yet we ate well. I'm not trying to propagandize for vegetarianism, because a vegetarian meal could be bad too, <laughs> depending on who. Depending on who's in the kitchen. <laughs> My point is just as pure history, as pure history. And something you need to know about how we survived, we had to take 
and slavery, the part of the pig that the white people threw away. The foot, the head, the guts, subsequently chitlins, and we made delicacies out of it. Then we, when we discovered collard greens, the genius of the black woman created partially a balanced diet in the <laughs> middle of slavery. So I think those of us who are all poor should go back on it once a year in <laughs> celebration of survival. <laughs> Because if it wasn't for the swine, maybe you and I wouldn't be here arguing about the swine. <laughs> now, my point is, we need to pick up some of the attitudes of togetherness that existed in African societies before this disruption coming from Western Asia mistakenly called the Middle East, because this disruption on African societies coming from Western Asia lasted 2,000 years before the Arabs came. What the brothers who are fascinated with this religion that they have not thoroughly studied, and with the Arab that they do not know at all, because pseudo-whites can be as ruthless as whites, and sometimes more so, is that no invader of Africa did Africa any good. Every invader did Africa more harm than good. And though the Arab was the last massive invader who refused to go home, he too, then and now, does Africa more harm than good. Every element that went into the making of Islam was already in Africa before the Prophet Muhammad. Every element that went into the making of Christianity was already in Africa before Christ. John Jackson's book, Christianity Before Christ, is very good on this subject, and it's a very respectful book. Don't think it's an anti-Christian book. It's just a good historical analysis of the elements of Christianity that existed in the world before somebody called it a name, formalized it, and dogmatized it around a mythical character called Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that this was right or wrong. I'm saying this is what happened. John Jackson, in his work, Christianity Before Christ, and in another work, Pagan Origins of the Christ Myth, said that had Christ rose 3,000 years before, he could have read his own autobiography. Because the same story was a part of the folklore of the world 3,000 years before Christ. The Western Asian people converted to the Hebrew faith, partly taken from Africa, placed the character of Christ inside of an already existing story that was an African story. Now, if you deal with the Bible as allegoric, as a great teaching instrument, as a great book for spirituality, how people use myth to illustrate truth and if you use myth to illustrate truth, and the truth gets across, the illustration need not be the truth. I wonder, do you understand? Yes. 
Africans at a time when books were not widely circulated, they wanted to make a point, they would tell a story about what they're talking about. And the story would illustrate the truth they're trying to get across in the logic. If the logic got across, no one questioned the truth of the, the, of the story because the story didn't have to be the truth. All right, now, there's an old African story, so hackneyed and so old. <coughs> if you don't know any of them, you know this one. How the spider got its uh, thin waistline. Used to be a chubby little fella, eating everything inside. So he heard of a banquet. The banquet is going to be close together. So he, he wanted to go to both of them. So he had his friend stationed in one banquet, and another in another banquet, tied a rope around his uh, string around his uh, waistline. So when the bank would start over here, pull the string, I'll go over there and eat. So over here, pull the string, I'll go over there and eat. Now you've guessed the end of the story. <laughs> Both bank would start at the same time. <laughs> Each friend obeyed the order and pulled on the string. And he's in the middle. And that's how the spider got his thin waistline. Now, African mothers tell this story to their children, even today, to keep them from eating too much, to tell them eat enough, but not too much. Now, if her point gets across about not eating too much, is anybody worried about whether her story is true or not? But a lot of stories in the Bible are the same way. <laughs> Does it matter whether Christ calmed the sailors or calmed the waves? Nature gonna calm the waves sooner or later. But a sailor running around on a small boat, very soon that boat gonna tip. You just calm the sailors. Nature gonna do the rest. Rain don't last forever. Wind don't blow forever. Storms don't last forever. It's a good story of faith, whether he calmed the sailors or whether he calmed the waves. Do you want to believe he calmed the waves? That's the holy approach. When you want to believe he calmed the sailors? That's the practical approach. Have your choice. You need not fight either way. Now, when you understand that so much that you think the Europeans started, started with you. And so much that he is trying to palm off on you as belief is merely a rehash of your original belief. Then you look at him in a different way. In the 15th and the 16th century, the Europeans <laughs> had to find a justification for what they were about to do for the next 500 years. They had come out of the period of the Crusades, a tremendous drain on the economy of Europe and the population of Europe, the agriculture of Europe. After that, the famines, the plagues that took one third of the population of Europe. They were hungry now. They were looking around for some outlet. After the Africans and the Arabs had conquered Spain and dominated the Mediterranean from 711 to 1492, the European was pinned into Europe. He had to feed on himself. 
in the Crusades, he went outside of Europe and discovered there were luxuries outside of Europe he had never heard of. Brocade, silk, perfumes, bath oils, and going to the Holy Land, a puritanical arrow, Saladin, he didn't bar them from the Holy Land because he resented the Europeans go over there searching for the Holy Grail that one lost in the first place and may not have been holy in the second place. <laughs> but every time they left the Holy Land was fleas, the place stunk, diseases spread. He was puritanical. He took three baths a day and was oiled down. How any man could find the time, I will not know, but that's what history tells me. He told them, stay away from here because of unsanitary. The African had produced in Europe something that previously did not exist in Europe, soap. and something else that the European had not thought about. Changeable underwear. <laughs> Common knowledge, drawers. <laughs> <laughs> the European saw the Ethiopian dress the Ethiopians had a shorter dress and something under it, the male, called Shema. The European took this and called it the Shemi. Now he has undergarment for the woman, undergarment for himself. Where is he getting his sense of sanitation? There's a book called Dirt, tells you the history of sanitation in Europe. Now, all palm olive soap is not made for you. And all the advertisement, they got a smiling white girl in the advertisement. Colgate toothpaste, smiling white people. If you are unsanitary, why aren't you smiling out of the air? Then we should be the best of buyers of the soap. We were, we were the makers of the soap. They got it originally from us. No mystery to me because I learned how to make soap as one of my chores growing up. Although I'd have a hard time remembering it now, but I made soap for the whole community. I mean, five cents and ten cents was a big thing when I was growing up. When you got a little boy who can boil the lime, and grease, and bones, and stir it up, and pour it out, cut it into squares, and distribute it to the neighborhood. No money exchange. Black people lived in this country in a pure socialist society of their own creation and didn't know it. And some people came give you something Karl Marx said. And now it becomes legitimate when you were practicing communism all along without dogma. There's a confusion today between the Groucho Marxists and the Karl Marxists. <laughs> the Grouchos have taken the day, Push the Karl Marxists aside. Now I'll admit that Karl Marx said some interesting things about class structure, and societies. But what he said about the class structure is not even applicable to us. And we ruin ourselves and start fighting among ourselves, arguing over it. Walter Rodney was a beautiful friend of mine. That's the point where we, he just wouldn't yield. I said Karl Marx's class structure 
had nothing to do with the structure in Africa because we didn't argue over class, we argued over status. And status was not determined by money. The chief royal drummer had a special door on his house, decorative, indicating he was the chief royal drummer. His house was the same size as everybody else's house. He didn't eat any more than anybody else. But what did he have? Status. He was a somebody in that society. He beat the drums for the king. That was his riches. He was equivalent in that society to a millionaire in our society, though he had no millions and no money of consequence. And when we are arguing class struggle, class status, based on someone else's, else's uh, evaluation, let us think that we came out of societies where we had these things without dogma. And when we had these things without dogma, they worked. They worked because we did not start any fights among each other because of them. Once someone dogmatizes it and formulizes it, then you got to argue about whether you believe in the dogma or don't believe in the dogma. You have to look at society and say fancy words, dialectic materialism. <laughs> the African no, didn't argue dialectic materialism. A man with six children needs more food than a man with two children. Feed him. End of argument. <laughs> <laughs> it's dialectic materialism. Materialism is giving each one enough to eat. Ain't no argument, ain't no dogma after that. Now what did happen to you in the 15th and the 16th century? The Europeans colonized most of the world, colonized history colonized information about history and information about the world, propagated a concept that the world waited in darkness for Europeans to bring the light. When everywhere he went in the world, he put out the light. And he destroyed civilizations that were old before Europe was born. He did not do the world any favor he did not spread any civilization because he had no civilization to spread. Mechanization is not civilization. I imagine that in the gas chambers of Germany, the gas was ready on time. The trains arrived on time. The people were psyched on time. There was even someone to extract the gold from the teeth of the deceased after they had been gassed. And he was ready to do his job. That was magnificent organization. It was also one of the greatest acts of organized barbarism in human history. And civilization had nothing to do with it. Civilization has nothing to do with whether you have a flush toilet or not, or whether you wear a pair of shoes. I'm not saying go without shoes. It's a very convenient, very convenient to have a pair of shoes. But do not think that that makes you civilized. To be civilized, you must be civil. People must be at peace among you. If people walk in fear among you, you are not civilized. Growing up in the South, every white person was a policeman to me. Everyone could take action against me. My word meant nothing. 
Years later, in northern Ghana, I had been up there with my African cut buddies for almost a month. I had forgotten that the white people were in the world. <laughs> Just us. <laughs> we all of it. And nothing else is needed. <laughs> I looked on the horizon and I saw a white man. I said, what, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> I remember growing up in the South, when you see a white man, you feel a little fear. All I felt was curiosity. What in the hell is he doing up here? I went out to investigate. He ain't got no chance. I got 16 of my cut buddies with me. <laughs> he had sent his help down. He was there doing some archaeological work somewhere. And they had misunderstood his message and hadn't brought back his supplies. And he was speaking bad English and poor, bad French too. But between his bad English and bad French, some of us could understand and we kindly located his help, who had carried out his order but misunderstood the time they were supposed to come back. We found them for them, got them all together. We arranged transportation for them to go back into the hinterlands, some kind of research he was doing up there. He thanked us profuse, we waved goodbye. I didn't feel nothing, I, but what was my act? What was our act? We didn't put upon him, and we lynched him. Nobody could do nothing about it. We didn't think about it. We didn't hit him. We didn't threaten him. We didn't call him any names. It was an act of humanity. It was an act of civilization. It had nothing to do with shoes, nothing to do with flush toilets, nothing to do with elevators, nothing to do with mechanical convenience. It had to do with the respect for the humanity of another human being. I didn't try to punish him for what his forefathers did to my forefathers. <laughs> Too often, we misunderstand the definition of societies. We misunderstand what a tremendous contribution we made to the whole world. We failed to tell our children what we did in spite of slavery and what we did in the midst of slavery. We launched some of the most significant revolutions in human history throughout South America and the Caribbean Islands. In South America, we launched a revolution built two independent states in Brazil, Bahia and Palmares. And Palmares fell because we became democratic. The Portuguese who escaped among us, we treated them well, and when they wanted to go back, we let them go back, and they went back and brought in a Portuguese army who destroyed our revolution. We are so trusting. We are more trusting of other people than we are of ourselves. But the African did not come to the so-called new world empty-handed. He came as a culture barrier. He came already knowing iron production. And some of the Artwork in New Orleans, throughout New Orleans, was done by African iron workers. He came with knowledge of farming. He came with knowledge of weaving. This was part of his survival in the Caribbean islands when some of the African craftsmen made a cutlass 
They also made a stabbing knife, was later used in the revolution. We were not a people without skill. The same kind of skill existed among the free blacks in the United States. Now you can buy this nonsense about people being lazy. We know our oppressors so well. Some of us refuse to let him work us to death. Some of us psyched him. Some of us ran a con game on him successfully. But we could not afford to be lazy. And if you look at the customs that we still have in the country that I grew up with, backwoods of Alabama, and Columbus, Georgia, I looked at some of these customs that I went to Africa and saw the other part. In the communities, if someone dies, the community, women of the community, takes all the furniture out of the house and clean the house. Put the furniture back in in order. That was an old sick joke in the South when they see a house in disorder. Why don't somebody die in this house so this house can get thoroughly clean? <laughs> If there's a death in the house, the community comes in and clean the house. That was a sick joke, but the significance is that we had a custom of helping each other. I came from a family of nine brothers and sisters. I was never at home when a child was born. My aunt, my grand aunt was a midwife and I would follow her up and down the hills and valleys of Alabama where she delivered children. It was a great adventure, adventure with Aunt Liza. The only difference, the difficulty is that they paid her off and potatoes and beans and these things were heavy and a little boy's <laughs> shoulder <laughs> only had so much strength. <laughs> that took the fun out of it. But following her around was great, and she would tell me stories. Go home, and my great-grandmother, who was a dear to me to this day, would tell me more stories. We need to let our children in on how we survived. Too many times they are going wrong because they're in a material world, they're in a violent world, the television is more that teacher than you are. We need to tell them that if you love yourself, you don't put poison in your veins. If you love yourself, you don't kill yourself, and you don't kill your brother, because he is the ally that might eventually save you. You have to make them care about life, you must make them care about themselves. We must have a broad, holistic view about African people and their place in the history of the whole world. Without us, this world would not be where it is. Without us, there would have been no British Empire Without us and what was taken away from us, there would be no Wall Street. Without us, there would be no financial empire in America because they would not have had the funds to bring it about. We have to look at the significance of our significance. We have to make claims over and above that of others. We must prepare our children to rule the state because the one thing people take away from you when they oppress you, they take away the memory of what you were before they interrupted 
your society. They know what you are not quite clear about today. You can never successfully oppress a consciously historical people because a consciously historical people will not let it happen. Some of them will stand up and say, look, fool, when you were in the caves of Europe cutting your brother's throats over dried bones, I was sitting on thrones of pure gold. I belong to the senior branch of the human race. I started it all. Then, reading our history carefully, it must start in the home, then in the schools, in the church can do a little less preaching, a little more teaching. The church can be lighted more times than the weekends. Have tutoring sessions in the church, athletic sessions in the church, history lessons in the church, sewing lessons in the church, language courses in the church. The church must be a holistic servant of the total community and not just a weekend thing where people go to show off a new dress. And the preacher must be more a teacher than a preacher. So that means you're going to have to throw out half of them. <laughs> or maybe more so. But if that's what you have to do in order to survive, and to take that next step forward, why hesitate in doing it? The one thing that's taken away from your mind during the oppression is the idea that you once ruled a state all by yourself. The greatest mistake we made all over the world, the Caribbean island, the United States, and in Africa, that once we came to the power of ruling a state, we adopted the apparatus of our oppressor. The apparatus of our oppressor will never suit our concept of ruling the state. Africa never had the nation state. To the African ever lasting credit, they never had a nation state. The nation state is too restrictive. It cuts cultures in half. It cuts intentions in half. It cuts economic systems in half. What we had was the territorial state, a cluster of states functioning, each sovereign was then a large overall state. We learned something we have to learn again. We lost and must learn again. Cultures fertilizes cultures. Let's stop using the word civilization for a while. Then maybe we'll understand what we have to go. Use the word culture, high cultures, low cultures, or cultures in transition. And remember, when there was no Europe, before the first European wore a shoe, or lived in a house that had a window, before the first semblance of a book appeared in Europe, our people had already organized the thought patterns that would go into all of the major religions of the world. They had already understood humanity. They had already developed a matrilineal system showing great respect for women. They had already said, if you've got a god, you have to have a goddess, because man is only one half of it. They had already realized, if you're going to bring a nation into being, you cannot imprison or restrict one half of its mentality, its women. 
The African had already acknowledged that the woman was the life giver. Her role was different in many cases, but her role was not one less important. Now, we would be drafted against our will and forced into exile into a culture incubator, alien to the original culture incubator of our creation. And in this alien culture incubator, what would we, we, would, we would find? How would we develop? What kind of people would come out of this second incubator that we didn't choose? Wife beaters. Well, no wife beaters in Alpha. People who impregnate teenagers. No such thing in Africa. Liars. Man, we forget the basic thing that held African societies together. Honor and obligation. Men who saw children and gave no support to children and think that they are men. Manhood is not just the impregnating a woman. That is a thing of short duration. Taking care of a child, understanding your responsibility is something of long range duration. If you're not ready for the second assignment, stay away from the first. <laughs> I'm not against sex, I'm not against love. I'm just putting it in proper perspective. Know what's involved and have the manhood responsibility of taking care of what's involved. Now, back to that Nile Valley and those river valleys of Africa, where when history was young, we put together and put forth to the world the folklore, the culture, the thought patterns that would go into the making of the Bible, the teaching stories that will lay the basis for the world's philosophy. All of this before others had given a thought. What people lose during oppression is self-confidence in the image of God as they originally conceive him to be. In our case, it's as we originally conceive him or her to be. We gave the world the first female gods. We gave the world the first societies where man rode behind a woman in war without feeling insecure under her leadership. We gave the world concepts of the humane relationship of man and woman that the world lost and have not regained to this day. And once we associate ourselves with foreigners, fakers, and fools, we take on the traits of foreigners, fakers, and fools. We must throw off these traits. We have reached a point where we are afraid to be kind to each other. Black men tell lies about black women. There's no foundation in truth. Black women tell the same thing about black men. There is no place for either one of us to go outside of each other and there is no escape hatch, no place in the, in the oppressor's camp or in the oppressor's home or in the oppressor's bed. All we've got is each other and you make up your mind about that. That's all you're going to get. Either we make it with each other or we don't make it. Remember, there was a time the world
took its measure on what we did. And we gave out to the world the humane thought that stabilized them so that they could create something that they would one day call civilization. Today, teach your children to think beyond their present position. Teach them to look beyond slavery. Look at slavery, of course, examine it, of course, and all of its consequences. Then look beyond it at independent states we rule we ruled exceptionally well. Then say to that young man and young woman, the people that did this had a mind, good intentions, commitment and drive. You have the same thing if you apply it. And remember, one people can do it Another people can do it. And if we did it before, of course, it is time that we seriously consider we can do it again. Thank you. ceremonies. Can you hear uh, Dr. Clark? Assembled guests, uh, we're very, very pleased that you are here and I come to talk to you about a piece of paper that you have inside your folders and if you have not had a chance to uh, read it, um, I would like you to look at it now or listen and look at it later. I'm going to talk about the John Henrik Clark Education Fund which is a fund that was established at Temple University uh, to support needy students in the graduate and undergraduate programs in African American studies under Dr. Malefi Asante. Uh, educators to Africa thought that this opportunity the, was just too great uh, to pass, let pass by. In Philadelphia, we have the first PhD program in African American studies. Um, you today saw and listened to uh, the kinds of students that are down there. And for a while, I was down there watching and listening to the wonderful minds and the commitment of these people. And so Educators to Africa wanted to say thank you, Dr. Asante, and others who have gone out on a limb and tried to do this for our community. <coughs> Educators to Africa wanted to say thank you to the students who have made the commitment to work for our community. You're not going to get rich teaching African American studies. You would go into, or uh, dealing with the African American community. You're going to have a richness, but it's not going to be a monetary kind of thing. But so we wanted to say as a community, we appreciate your stepping out into the forefront for us. And thirdly, we think that we have just a gem in Dr. John Henry Clark, and I think you would agree with me. Would you think that <laughs> and we wanted to honor him in the academic community so that his name and what he stands for will go on and on. And we have, uh, in the last um, year, been able to raise 
$10,000, and we wanted to formally uh, present that to Dr. Asante. Now, Dr. Asante said he, and he's, you know, if you know Dr. Asante, he's hither and yon and all. And um, so today, he, he has asked uh, Sandra Milner to accept for the students and I am asking you to think about helping us to support them. Maybe it won't. It won't be. Uh, it won't be Sandra Milner. But <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but there are there are so many ways that we yeah, can help, and there are times when the community just needs to be there to say we back you. You're out there for us. We want to back you. Please seriously think about contributing to Educators to Africa's. John Henry Clark Fund. Yeah. Okay. I, I would like to thank you on behalf of Dr. Asante and Dr. Carrioma Welsh Asante and on behalf of the department. And um, I don't know if you know anything about this department, but we are growing. We're overwhelmed with applications from all over the world. Um, but yet within the university, we really don't get the... No the support or money that, that we deserve and that we need. The university itself did an audit and um, concluded that two departments should be expanded, uh, the African American Studies Department and the Psychology Department. Mm -hmm. The audit came and went. <laughs> Still, we have not been expanded, I mean, even though it, the need has been recognized. So I'd like to thank you for the support, particularly from this community. I'd like to announce that those persons who are interested in having a videotape of Dr. Clark's address, you may leave your name and address with our president, Mr. Ted Irwin, and we'll inform you uh, as to when the tape will be available. I'm going to ask that all the members of Educators to Africa please stand so that everyone can see who you are. We're going to ask Mr. Bob Brown if he would raise his hand. He's the chairman of the program committee. Are there any questions for Dr. Clark? Anyone have a question for Dr. Clark? If not, we'll ask our president, Mr. Ted Urban, if he would give some remarks at this time. This has certainly been a grand occasion. Uh, certainly is one of the best that we've been able to have. And why not the, the, the dean of the African Center perspective? It's only been recently that we began to hear about the African Center perspective. But people have some of the great minds of our community have been delivering this message for years. And Dr. Clark is certainly one of the major minds and one of the major messengers. We certainly are very, very proud and pleased with the performance of the students this morning. What did you say? Yeah. We thought that their message was extraordinary. Each year they get better. This is the third year that we've had the students on our program. And we are thankful for the Department of African American Studies at Temple. Temple University thought that program was going to fail. Many of the professors laughed at it. Who wants a degree in African American Studies? And as you heard, it's one of the fastest growing because it is needed. We look forward to seeing you again. We hope that you join us next year when we have our 23rd annual seminar. We look forward to seeing you. God bless you. And remember, 
that you can purchase Dr. Clark's speech downstairs uh, where we had um, where we had lunch. So stop in. The vendors are still there. Also, please give me your name and address, and I'll inform you when the video is ready. Also, look for Dr. Clark's book, Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust. Um, is it is it downstairs? Is it, do you have it? There should be some copies available. And that will give you bookstores where you can purchase. Okay, there, there should be copies available. Otherwise, we'll give you the bookstore where you can purchase them. Uh, or any of his books. If you want to continue this, this discussion, read any of Dr. Clark's books. And he will continue this discussion. Thank you very much.